Hello everybody, this is Miriam Thiel Alberts. You're watching or listening to Animal Wisdom Stories. And today I'm really, really happy to have Anna Twinney here, all the way from Colorado. Hello, Anna. <laughs> Hi, well, it, well, it's good morning for me. It's later in the day for you. That's it's true. <laughs> gorgeous. It's gorgeous in Colorado right now. So, welcome. Welcome, yes, thank you. Um, Anna, you are a horse whisperer, an animal communicator, a mentor, a writer, a coach, a public speaker, and an energy healer. That one I nearly missed. So, and today we're talking a little bit about your, your animal communication role or what, what you're teaching. Um, but I'm sure that, you know, the other roles will come in as well. So, uh, well, it's wonderful to be here. And I know you were thinking, and what you're, often people ask is where does it begin and how does it unfold? And for me, I could go back to a living in Germany. I grew up in Germany from the age six, actually it might have been five, to about 16. I spent a long time in Germany and I'd call it my idyllic childhood. It was one of those where even now when I go back to Europe, it's like going back in time in a wonderful way where the children are hanging out or can go to school on their bicycle. And um, th there's a connection to nature, right? And so for me, I look back at that time in my life and I think it began with the fact that I had a love for nature. I had that ability to ride my horse as a very young person without anybody knowing where you go, no cell, no cell phones, no emergency button to call. You just went out all day long and spent the time with your horses. But I guess my, my greatest memory of looking back of where did my animal communication truly begin, it wasn't a gift that I nurtured throughout my childhood. I was also in a traditional home, like many, that um, you're looking for a long career. And I still go back, you know, to Germany, like I've been about a decade, and everybody's looking for that security of having the qualification or the job security or the 30 years. And that hasn't changed much. And I'm sure mainstream is like that, mainstream America, mainstream Europe. And it was like that for me. And I had two different careers before I was a horse whisperer. And everything bleeds into the other and you begin to learn as to why that happened in your life. Why did I go to the city and work in London? You know, why did I serve the people as a first responder? Where does that always play a part? But it played a big part for me in animal communication and my style of animal communication. So when I look back, my first memories of the animal communication coming in as an adult would be while I was a first responder. I got called home, funnily enough. My bird used to be called Monty, he's a little cockatiel. And Monty was gorgeous, but I remember going back home while on duty and finding him not in a good state at the bottom of the cage and needing medical support. And so I look at that to go, where's that fall into all of this? What part of my life does it mean? And, and um, the left brain logic that I carry from black, white and gray, when you're taking care of humans and taking care of situations and learning to deal with adrenaline rush situations. Well, it came in with automatic motion to go home and find yourself there intuitively when you never go home when you're working. That was the beginning for me of the animal communication of knowing what my dog needed, feeling and sensing if something wasn't going well and equally as much as to what the joy is, not just simply reading the body language, so it began there for me, Miriam, but it really began becoming Reiki attuned. Mm -hmm. That's where it's, it's as though everything fell apart, um, was wide open. And I became attuned with Reiki in 19, I always get this slightly wrong, 19, it must have been 97 Reiki attuned. I was 27. And many people find that their lives change at the end of the 20s, late 20s. I was one of those people. And attuned by somebody in London who had brought Reiki to England. And it was incredible. My life changed thereafter. So with it, a move to California 
to become a horse whisperer with it the move to actually study under one of the greatest horsemen still alive today and that opened the channels of animal communication many believe animal communication is body language you know the the amount of natural horsemanship workshops and demonstrations i do where you slow down and you ask them what is animal communication for you well, it's understanding this horse's movements, that they're calm, they're quiet, or what's their thinking. And you realize that for a set degree of individuals, that's animal communication. So for me, horsemanship opened the doors to animal communication. And I created a day called the Holistic Horse Day. And it's a one day event where people can see the body language followed by, funnily enough, either muscle testing for nutrition or the equine chakra system. Mm -hmm. and out an incredible chakra banner we can actually send you one um, it's beautiful chakra banner as well as the reiki forces dvd and the third part of the day is animal communication and for me that's the animal's language body language energy animal communication and so the doors begin to open through natural horsemanship to get that foot in the door to say, you know what guys, there's more to the language than simply a system, a cookie cutter approach or a dialogue where it's advanced and retreat. So hopefully I kind of went back enough for you to, <laughs> that's where it began, but fast forward a little bit to how I ended up in the United States. You know what I really, I, I love that you were saying that um, everything changed with the uh, Reiki attunement. Yeah. Because this is how it happened for me as well. Um, I was given a horse that was wild. Um, I wasn't a very good rider. So these two paired together is not the ideal situation. So I thought, what can I do, you know, to help the situation, to help our communication? And I actually, I didn't know that much about horses. So I, I went into Reiki as well. And Reiki helped me... Um, kind of support that bond you know helping us both to um start bonding because i felt in the in the horse training you know he's a very nice horse now he's not wild anymore and we we ride together um outside you know go into the forest and all that um but the reiki helped us um to develop that sort of communication and being on the same level or being on the same page um, and that was really what the horse training was all about for me. Everything else that came after that, you know, the going left, going right, going forward, backwards, right. it's sort of that kind of fell into place. But the most important thing was because the wild horse, my, my horse wasn't trained. He was seven years old and he hadn't, he hadn't been trained. So, um, yeah, I love that. Uh, I'm not the only one that went through that sort of um, that no, you, you didn't. I had traditional German upbringing, funnily enough, with a British accent and horsemanship. And then in Britain, I had the classical dressage. And when I became Reiki tuned, for me, it was huge because I got uprooted from my house. So I put a career behind me, a good career. I put a husband behind me who mm. we were in love together a home, a dog, a horse, a house and family. And I left with nothing more than a suitcase, not knowing if I would be back or how, or when I'd be back. And in fact, I never did. I lost all of it. And it, it is a loss because it was the loss of an incredible relationship and an incredible career that I appreciated, even if I wasn't cut out for it. And then looking at the change, of course, looking back it's all meant to be in its destiny and it was as though the reiki kicked that in and now i look fast forward i'm living in a gorgeous place in colorado i go and travel the world and my passion pays and i'm able to educate thousands of individuals per year on it while at the same time having an incredible family and home so i'm hoping that in time when people hear the story and they take a risk that they realize that that risk, if you, if one, you get into your heart and you can feel that heart and it's a gauge, but two, this is a big one, is taking the action. I'm, I'm not somebody that feels that it gets 
dropped into your lap. I've worked exceedingly hard for everything I've had. And people don't know what work, work hard is until they have their own business. And it was funny, there's a one liner that a famous actress was saying that um, only an entrepreneur would leave a 40 hour business behind or paid job to work 80 hours a week. And that's exactly it. You go and you're driven by a passion and you're driven by making a difference and you're staying in that center. And my business decisions, Miriam, have all been made on what I sense and feel. And it's, it's primarily what I sense and feel. So my head might have an idea, creative idea, but my heart is where I go with. That's basically, um, you know, with the animal communication as well, isn't it? I mean, this is how, how I sort of, you know, this is for me, the communication, trying to find the words that match the energy that you're receiving and uh, sometimes kind of, you know, listening into your heart. Is this the right match or is this what, is this the right picture, what you're getting or what am I getting, you know? That's, that's exactly it. It's interesting. We have a mentorship program and people have been part of it either a year, two or three. And as part of it, they get different webinars. And some of the webinars are me lecturing, supporting them. But other webinars, just like this, it's interactive and they have questions. And some of the questions would be things like, how do I get this connection? Why does it take so long? Um, how can I trust this information? Well, it's just like any language, and especially you, you're speaking two languages. Now, if we study a language at school, you're looking at the book or the teacher, the interaction and play, it becomes colloquial. But it's a, still a study of this word means this. So when we learn a foreign language, it feels uncomfortable to us, or where Spanish is concerned, you could get the Mexican Spanish and the Brazilian, I guess, or the Portuguese, different <laughs> guys, right? And whichever country you go into, there's a different dialect or a dialogue. Well, the challenge with the animal communication for people would be that they can't become me. You can't really simply write that book to say, a plus B is C for the fact that this can come, like you're stating, many different ways. There's the clairvoyant where you see it. Could be a picture or a movie. There's the clairsentient where you feel it. The clairsentient feeling, for me, you identify now the difference between intuition and intuition is a form of animal communication, but not necessarily animal communication because it could be an intuitive hit. So then we can also see those words written. And people have often commented to go, oh, I prefer to see the movie, not the word, but it's the same in as far as you've still got a sense of the past, the present, the future. Does it relate to the animal, a situation, a person, just like a movie? How long is that movie? You're still feeling, is it the past, the present? Is it something they're concerned about or referencing? So then we have, what do we taste? What do we smell? But there's other ones that are awesome that people get, automatic writing, automatic speech, automatic motion. Then you get the mythical piece of what does that sword mean or the rose mean, symbolic meaning. What am I hearing sound-wise? What am I hearing the voice-wise? Is it my voice? Is it somebody else? So here's the difference between this and any other language. When we speak German and you'd say, Guten Morgen, Miriam, wie geht's dir? Right? Very clear. How are you? This is it. But in our language, if I sent you a picture, you'd have to figure out, did she say good morning with the rose? Or what am I sensing here? It becomes unique to the individual. And it's more difficult. So it takes longer because it's unique to the person and they have to learn the sensation of the past, the present, the future, mine, yours. They have to learn it and there's no fast track. So it's not like this little mountain to go, you know what, I'm really good at languages, I'll just go to the top. No, you have to learn your dialect, your nuance, your, your interpretation, your perception. You can't fast forward it. And I did a survey years ago when I was doing these webinars. So I've been doing them for a number of years and we collated that information and we have around 150, maybe 175 hours of worth of information. So it always puts it into perspective for people when they think they're learning animal communication and you'll hear it. People will say, well, I've been on the weekend course. I've learned that. 
yeah, you learned maybe three hours of lectures on a weekend course. Imagine 200 hours worth of no repetition. So this is really deep. We can learn a superficial language. We can learn to be a secretary, or we could learn a dialogue and have depth. And the depth could mean, what's the animal source contract? What's their role? How are we dialoguing between us? Is that animal taking on disease or behavior manifestation? So there would be a far deeper piece versus simply they like their, their food, their kibble, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. the door outside. So there's great depth. But it all depends on the individual as to the commitment. So for me, I look at it to go, you know what? One year you learn your symbolism and you learn how to receive it and you become a great secretary. Another year you learn dialogue. And then maybe a third year you begin to wear that hat to go, I enjoy ministry work or I enjoy life coaching. I enjoy um, behavior modification. And you begin to look at it in your third year of animal communication to come back with my talent is talking to the other side or past mm -hmm. lives, yeah. reincarnation. And it's not until the third year that people can really understand their talents. So, so your mentorship is actually over three years. Is it's that a choice, Miriam. You know, what I, what I created was something that was never available to me. That's a great way to say it. Everything mm -hmm. I've done. I've created because it was never available to me. And so what we created was a year long. And what happened with that is people can go into, we called them three tiers. One tier was, here's your home study pack. You get the DVDs and the webinars and the information. It's around 200 hours. I've lost count. And then we did one where you buy that and you interact on the webinars and you get the live live coaching or the downloads etc and then we did a third one which included all of that plus 12 days at the house so six days wow. at the beginning six at the end. so people could choose and the, and the reason i say is never available to me for me i didn't this wasn't existing 20 years ago and so you can say you know what you don't have those thousands or you don't have that time go with the home study pack. At least you get something really cool. Or you have the time and the finances and the resources and you're looking at a career change. Here, jump into this one. Now, at the same time where I said multiple years, what's happened is people would dive into that first home study pack and then go, you know what? I really want more interaction. Now they can upgrade to mm -hmm. the second or they could be with me live in person and then say I still need help let me still tune into these webinars the next year and so I've got students that have done one year two years three years and I'm here I'm here to say you know what? I can help you through this if you're having a problem with a dog with dementia I can tell you what the problem is and how to navigate through it or or if you're looking at um people issues and how to deliver information, which is always a common question of, it's funny, on one, way, on one course I had this woman say, well, I'm the confidant. I get all this information and I'm the confidant. And so I decide what to pass on. And I said, that's not your job. You're not the confidant. Yeah. I don't know where you got that, but that's misguided. We are not there for that. We are the linguist. We're the translator. We're the messenger. We can't pick and choose and go, oh, I don't think that client's ready for that. Or, oh, they shouldn't hear that. That's not our job. Our job is to package it correctly. So when we look at it like that, we're looking at one, learn to receive information. And it becomes clear as to why it takes so long. Two is learn how to dialogue. Dialogue with puppies through to geriatrics, dialogue with different breeds, different species, you know, the sloth versus the python versus, versus the gorilla. We've got a dialogue with different species. And then on top, you've got different ailments, so diseases or mental states, and some are loyal, some are withdrawn, some are confused, some have got ADD. So now we have to learn to dialogue with that. And then on top of that, we have to learn to present to the people. Because what we're not here, we're not sitting in judgment going, you're an awful person, your dog's on the chain, he hates you. You know, that that's not the delivery. We've got to then learn, well, how do you say that? You know, you've got somebody asking, how does my dog feel? How do you say, well, have you considered that 
being being restricted this much and not having any voice or choice how he would feel you've got to learn to deliver and that is equally as important as it is to learn the language which then puts it into this full package to go you know what how long does it take to be a minister or a veterinary assistant or a life coach years and so animal communication in my experience you want to be you want to be putting that animal's life in your hands where somebody's making a decision whether or not they're going to euthanize or not we better be a hundred percent spot on on what we're saying because people believe it and trust immensely so the trust that's being delivered you've got to know that you're not you're not making this up it has to be accurate so this is i mean this is basically one of the big challenges when you learn uh, animal communication um and by the way i think your approach is great you know to to have that um in-depth mentorship uh, this program where you can sort of choose which which levels you want to go to and have somebody to take you by the hand and say this is this is okay this is normal what you're experiencing and you can try this or uh, try that um, it's a bit of a shame because it's there's not many many of those programs you know um, people as you said they go on a weekend course and that's you are an animal communicator and sometimes, you know, maybe there's some very, very talented people and they can do it and they don't need the programs. Other people could do it as well, but they need a little bit more help to um, navigate through their feelings and through their energies, their, their own energies. So I think it's great to, to have that. Um, and, and people get enamored by it so what happens is that every weekend class i have even three hours if i do a three-hour demo people get successes and on a weekend yeah. class of course it's about empowerment and we can funnily enough Miriam, we go back to the reiki here because what the reiki does in the class it not only empowers you're doing the full potential highest potential of the individual you're holding space the successes are coming in people see the success as well and they should they need to feel amazing because suddenly their childhood dream and dr doolittle it's all real so now we've had a paradigm shift so the person comes in maybe a little skeptical or a little cynical a uh, little doubt concern etc they leave going oh my goodness we connected communicated i'm an animal communicator i couldn't do that now i am and what happens is when they leave the friends and the family come knocking to go you know what try it with my own animal and they are so enamored that they say wow you couldn't have known this this all must be true all of it must be true but here's the thing we have to know when do we fall out of it and when do we stay so it's not like a plug unfortunately i've got a plug in my computer and it's not like we just plug it into the computer and go we're connected no the human brain is so intelligent it's google now, I think Google was based on the human brain. And what that means is we can type in a word, and this was going to be part of my exercise at the end, but we can type in a word like Doberman. And I can guarantee the audience, the viewers, the listeners will go Doberman and click. It's going to click down to last Doberman you saw. Because now we can relate to that as either word association or memory. And our memory is incredible. So we have that to deal with. So when we're connecting with the animal, it would be amazing if we simply put that plug in and everything stayed connected, but it's not. You would hear a noise, you get pulled out. You have your dog touch your feet, you get pulled out. Or you relate to it and go, oh, I remember that. And now your brain goes to your own situation. So we're not staying plugged in. The brain has 60,000 thoughts. 60,000 thoughts a day. So with 60,000 thoughts, we have to identify what's animal communication, what it isn't. And that's the glory. And the glory is this, it's a heartfelt language. So you're moving from the head to the heart and the skill is to stay between the two. Because some of it, if you're skilled in animal communication, you're navigating the conversation. And at first it's a conscious thought. And the conscious thought would mean you would hear something or receive it and see it and you'd consciously dialogue but in time 
it becomes unconscious, that you see it and unconsciously you think of the question and bam, it's already answered by the animal. So at first we truly start with unconscious unconsciousness, right? And then we be become conscious to our unconsciousness. And then we become conscious to the consciousness. And then we become unconscious to the consciousness because the mere fact that it becomes second nature. So in fact, we go through all these stages of learning and doubting and confused and owning, having ownership to the point where it becomes ours. And so natural to us that the natural born teachers would find it harder to teach because they've got nothing to hold on to. Why? Because through their whole life, they've been naturally gifted with it. It's the people that struggled. Hello, that would be me. <laughs> I struggled, worked really hard at it because it was important to me. And as soon as I realized, well, this is real. You know, honestly, it would be this bleep is real um, for the fact that once you understand they're talking. So I think than everything. OK, so you're back. There was a little bit of um, a slight the interference. Freezing of the frame. Yeah. And I don't know what you missed. No, there, just a little bit at the end, but I think it'll, yeah, I don't know. Do you want to go back or we just start with a fresh question? I think you're good just there. Right. Um, what I was wondering, what do you do? Um, you know, when, when, when a student receives something, there is, you know, you have a perception of that. You have the association of that. You have the interpretation of that. How do you guide a student through that situation um, to know what's true? Yeah, we layer it. And I think right. the layer is really important. So, for example, let's go with one scenario that the individual gets a picture or a short movie. Let's go with that first. And then we can change it because people will say they know and they're not getting that. But the majority of people do. They get the movies. So what you're looking at first is what are you truthfully seeing? And what I do is I show a picture and I ask them to speak about that picture. So for example, let me think about it. For example, they're seeing this picture, this, they're seeing it that you say, okay, I'm seeing a dog sitting on a pile of snow. That would be the first student. So then I say, anybody else want to have a go at it? Well, I'm seeing your dog Merlin sitting on a pile of snow. Perfect. Okay. So then I'll say, but what are we really seeing? And we'll come back to, I'm seeing a dog. He looks a little bit older. He has at least three colors on him. It's black, it's gray, it's white. His eyes are dark in color and quite sparkly. The snow pile is about four feet in height and he's on top of it, looking over it. He doesn't look cold because he's got a nice thick coat. Behind him, I see some evergreens and it seems like it's a really sunny day. It reminds me of Colorado. So what happens is people learn to speak more because what we're doing is we're asking you, Miriam, if I saw a picture of one of your animals, I'm asking you to place what I'm describing. So not only am I saying, hey, I'm connecting to your horse. He is X color, Y, Z, but I'm asking you to see him either for who he is today or who he was in the past. And your animal is trying to relate a very specific scene. So the more detail I can give, the more you're able to go, you know what, I remember that day. So not only is it delivering, but it's for you to remember it because the message is yours. It's important to you, not for me, to you. So you've got to be able to place it. So we have to have a degree of detail. Now on top of that, let's change that detail a little bit. Let me think, no, I'll stick, stick to that picture. On top of it, we would then say, what are you feeling? So we've seen that the sky is blue and there's white snow, but what are you sensing? And that would be the next thing. What are you sensing? Well, I'm sensing that there's a deep relationship between two people. I'm sensing that he's exceedingly loyal and he loves to be by your side. Now we're sensing. 
So now we've gone from what are we seeing to what are we sensing? But then we could also add in there, what's the perception here? What is the perception? Is this midwinter? Is this Colorado? Is that a perception? So we add in, what are you seeing? What are you sensing? And what are you perceiving? So we begin to layer it. And thus people can expand to say, was this the past? Is this the present time? What, what's he trying to convey? And you've got to go inside. And then you learn the difference between what am I truly seeing from that one picture and what am I sensing? It's like watching a TV screen without any sound. You turn it off. And it could be a horror movie without the, without the music, you won't know. And so it's the music that puts it in there unless it's a terrible scene or it could be a rom romancing movie or rom-com, right? And you can see a little scene in your sense it. So that's exactly what this is about, is learning it. So it's really important. Now, on top of that, I think I explained, um, to the begin with, I explained that it might be a download, like a computer download. But at the same time, you've probably, when you first begin this, maybe have a 10, 15% chance that it's true animal communication because the mind can go. So we looked at the download, which could be a memory. So if we look at the Black Stallion, and if I said black stallion to the audience, they might go, you know what? I remember one at a breeding farm. Farm. Somebody else could say, actually, it's only in the movies that I've seen it. For me, the black stallion was real. And I rode him on a Santa Barbara beach in California and swam with him. So if you think of black stallion, I think of that memory. But if you don't have a memory, you would go to a different kind of piece, i.e. a memory for TV. But if you don't have any memory at all, then you're going into maybe a projection. So you have projection, preconceived idea, memory, but you also have imagination. And that's a big thing for all of us. Hopefully our imagination has been nurtured and children will go to that. So we've got to identify if I tell you about my dog, Merlin, whose picture I described, maybe people go, oh, Merlin, he must have been a magician. Oh, yeah, I can imagine him doing this, this, and this. So now we've moved into imagination. Really quickly, the brain ran with a story that it created, and it will flourish. And before you know it, people can just go into it and describe their whole story, which has nothing to do with animal communication, because their imagination and their storytelling ran away with them. So a lot of it's about the validation. And I talked about plugging in and unplugging. So it's about the validation to say, okay, you've connected with this dog. How did all of this feel? Because tick these boxes, you were definitely connecting. That's how he looks. That's his character. That's exactly what he'd convey. These are the activities he's a, he, he liked. But what happened here? How did your sensation change or your emotion change? Did the movie come in from another angle? What happened here? Because that's not him anymore. And the person can often then identify to go, you know what, I got distracted there. Or I realized my own dog came in at that point because he wanted to talk to me. And it could be that he talked to you, your own dog. Or it could be that your brain felt guilty and you went, oh, if I'm talking to that animal, I should be thinking of my own. Or, oh, Merlin triggered that he loves to go to water. Oh, I haven't taken mine to water. And suddenly your brain goes to all the things that you haven't done or what you're missing or what you think your dog would want. So the ability is to, on hindsight, look back and get a ton of validations every step of the way. That's the key. And it's the validations that bring in the confidence for the person. And it's that that you build it on to go, I remember what it felt like when I got that right. That's the big thing. Now, a lot of this is then in the delivery, Miriam. And I find that when people are learning that they'll come back with it concrete. Your dog is saying, no, you don't know if he's saying. And you don't know until at least a year if he's saying that. Because you've got to develop it more like, I believe he's saying, or I feel like, I sense. Versus I know, because you don't know until you've got so much feedback that you know you're always on the mark. You're always hitting the target. And that comes with practice. You know, when you were talking about the layering, I was really reminded, um, I trained as a, a script writer. I went to film school. And 
there's a similarity between your layering approach and developing a screenplay or a character in the screenplay because you actually go through different layers as well and I think that script writing has also like this intuitive side to it you know does it fit does the character is it authentic you know would the character do this so you're, you're kind of connecting with the words or the story with the storytelling and it you know it just brought back to me that maybe my my screenwriting uh past has helped me um you know with my animal communication because it is like you know for me screenwriting was always about is this right you know always questioning something comes in or oh, the the character could do this or that and also you know trying to validate that with the body response you know with your own you know sensations feelings so that's exactly it and it's funny you brought that up because when individuals have felt like giving up or slowed down or been confused or felt the door shut on them one one i can help them to say you will not get a larger larger individual i was going to say but you won't get somebody that um has been more cynical and skeptical than me that was me number one number two my brain has been checked and I've done the neurofeedback and the results where I've never seen a busier brain than yours. So I have the busiest brain that they ever saw. I was the most skeptical person. So I have those things to say, you know what? You think you're skeptical? I was. You think you're busy? I'm the busiest brain that's ever been recorded in this, this doctor's office. So if I can quiet my brain, so can you. And so with this, here's the layers and this is what I put in my webinar at one point I went you can't be me you don't have my footsteps you can't walk in my moccasins but what you can do because people would say you know how do I train to life coach how do I train to be a teacher well I was doing it since I was 17 I, I can't give you that piece on top or how do you investigate how do you learn to interview been doing that since I was 18 so all of those pieces come together today so people are asked on one of the webinars to create a timeline and that timeline is start looking at what you've learned and bring your qualities forward everybody has qualities if they were a teacher they know how to talk to children or adults adolescents even learning difficulties whatever the quality is bring it forward you know if you've you're an accountant, you've struggled if you haven't talked to people because you've just got the numbers, but start looking at what the qualities you do have in that area to be supportive. And maybe it's an analytical mind to look back over and go, you know what, I need these steps. Because so much of animal communication isn't step-based. It's not a thing of go sit down, <laughs> I'm gonna give you the steps now, ground <laughs> yourself, center yourself, breathe and just be. And people will go, I don't even know how to, just be and that's hard to develop and become that and mm -hmm. so they prefer to, for you to say well breathe follow your breath for 10 minutes and once you've hit that mark then you do this well unfortunately it's not like that because if you stayed in your head and you're not in your heart you won't connect either so a lot of this is about your own skills if you did yoga pilates you know how to breathe you know if you were teaching you know how to talk if you were a first responder, you've dealt with adrenaline rush situations, et cetera, et cetera. So you begin to look at your qualities and bring them forward. That's my, that's my kitty climbing the <laughs> door looking outside, if you can hear anything. But it's exactly that, Miriam, that you begin to look at the qualities of the layering. And when you write a book or you, I've created a number of DVDs, I would look at it through different eyes and one might be what clips do i like what clips sound good what's got the volume of the materials in it you know what's the educational value what could go wrong here so everything you're looking at would be layered and the same with the animal communication if i've got a dialogue going and your first response for a a dog running away would be don't run away well, that's not going to do anything. Why should he not run away? He's been running away forever. So you've got to look at the dialogue to go, why is it you're running away? And for behavior modification, 
call it the five WHs, they really do come in, which is the why. You know, why are they doing what they're doing? What is it exactly that they're doing it? When are they doing it? What is causing it? Um, how are they doing it? who caused it so all of these things and so people will ring up and go could you just is the favorite the favorite sentence could you <laughs> no i can't just because it's not fair it's not fair to tune in and go why are you doing this that's a very one-sided conversation for the client when in fact wouldn't i want to find out why he's doing it tell me why you're doing it what, what, what are you doing when you're doing it? What's causing this behind it? How can we best support you? Those are the questions versus simply finding out why is the dog peeing or biting? Why is the horse bucking? Don't we want to know the cause behind it? Let's not put a Band-Aid plaster on it. Let's look at the cause because there's always a reason if we don't understand it. And that's where our minds come in to say, here's our balance. I want to be in the heart. But I don't just want to come back to go, oh, he's bucking because, um, you know, he doesn't feel you're the right rider. Okay, well, what does that even mean? Um, are you present? Are you a good enough rider? Are you advanced? Are you actually too advanced? Are you asking him something he doesn't want? Are you asking in the wrong way? Does the bit fit? Have you had checked his teeth? Is his saddle fit? I mean, is he on the right nutrition? Does he get enough turnout? What does he mean by you're not the right rider? It could mean 15 things. And if we're not into it, if we don't care, ultimately it boils down to that, if you don't really care and just go, oh, let me ask, and you don't really care, and you're not involved and engaged with that question, you're gonna get a very superficial answer back. And for me, that's not good enough. For me, if I wanna help that animal, I need to understand exactly what's going on. So, so do you find that coaching the human is also part of the animal communication that, um, you know, taking that message that you receive and really look into how can we implement that into our lives? This, it, All of it. Okay. All of the coachings are playing a part. So what it means is the coaching would be educating the person to say, let's reach your highest potential. And what happens is from one year to the next um, people will get more. So was, I explained that. So if, for example, they first got pictures the next year when they come back to another class, they might get movies. If they got movies one year, they might now intuit and sense more on top of it. So coming back can open doors to a greater depth. Now, on top of that, people don't know what they don't know. So they don't necessarily know that you've got to explore the don'ts and the do's or well, you've got to explore the whys and the hows. So you're explaining that, so you're coaching on that level. Then you're opening up more paradigms to come back with, did you know that a dog could take on this disease for you? Did you know that? So now I'm gonna coach you on how that's possible. So with that coaching, we now need to look at your self-care because people pay attention when you come back to go, do you understand this dog has manifested this behavior due to you or on behalf of you or with you? So now we get into the coaching where it comes down to, is this the dog's behavior? So is he self-mutilating because he's had a rough past or is he self-mutilating because he's taking it on for you or is he self-mutilating because it's his path and your path and it's a parallel path and that's the depth of animal communication because at first if we don't peel away those layers we just go here's a dog eating himself we need to spray something on there that he doesn't oh my goodness no we need to figure out that this is the trust point just here that's the acupressure trust point and so he's self-soothing why is he self-soothing? What's happening? Is it his past that he hasn't let go of? So Reiki could come in there. Or is it the present time? Has something changed? Now we develop, is it his? Or is it yours? So there's the next piece of coaching. The other piece after that becomes the delivery. Because what you don't want to do, I keep on bringing you in, but I don't want to go, Miriam, you know, you've caused this. Your dog is eating himself mm -hmm. because you're not doing self-care. 
I won't do that delivery if you're you, Miriam. You're kind, you're sweet, you're trying. And if you're crying, it would be a different delivery. Or if you're taking ownership, if you come back and go, no, I'm fine. No, I'm fine. No, I don't know what you're talking about. Then I have to find other avenues to go, okay, to this dog, help me here. She, she doesn't see what you're seeing. So we need to deliver something really concrete and something really validating that only you know so that she takes this seriously. I might even go back to them and say that. And then I could come back and go, hypothetically, he's telling me the marriage has split up and he's been chewing himself since then. And then you see the person go, oh. And it doesn't mean that they're trying to be difficult. It means that for them, they don't know what the hell you're saying. <laughs> they just, it doesn't, compute doesn't make sense the dog is eating we need a vet it doesn't make sense that it's something else so you're changing a paradigm to go your dog is taking on the anxiety in the household that's not possible the way we grow up so there's a lot of compassion for the person and there's sometimes a soft approach sometimes a deliberate approach sometimes a direct approach sometimes evidence-based and you're packaging it on the person that all becomes coaching and then the coaching is how can we make the change and what's possible so that you're even getting into a deeper piece you went nice and deep quickly which would be the navigation and the negotiation to go you know what okay will your dog stop now that you've acknowledged what's going on will he stop now nope he won't stop why won't he stop now okay let's look at what he needs from you to be able to stop this no, so it's really neat. To, sorry, I broke you off there, but it's neat to see. Maybe the dog will go, oh, relief. You spilled the beans, everything's good. Or maybe he'll come back, and I've had it in sessions where the animals have asked, no, we need to put a schedule on the fridge, and she needs an accountability buddy because she'll never do this. And you look at them, and they smile and go, he's right. I, I just wouldn't do the fitness and the diet without being in a program. So what you learn is you learn more about that person and how they operate in the world and that that dog could be in their life for that specific reason to get them fit. And it might not be fitness through taking them for a walk, but actually to say, you know what, I'm going to take this on because that's my role in your life right now. So did yeah. that actually happen? With the dog that was biting himself? I probably probably made that one <laughs> up right now. But the, the accountability on the fridge, absolutely. I remember delivering, and I don't remember all my sessions. It's just too many. But I delivered information, and the dog came back with, not enough, she's not going to do it. She needs this on the fridge, and I did. And then he said, not enough, she needs this. Um, but absolutely, there will be situations, and it could be so. Our dog, Oliver, used to lick this area for mm -hmm. the trust. And he had been in five homes before he came to us. So um, not only had the past affected him, but his self-worth was down the toilet. And so he wasn't concerned. See, see, somebody that hears that, for example, the mind, this is great animal communication skill right now. If my students heard me say, Oliver licked himself because he had five homes, your mind could go to, oh, you haven't made him feel comfy. Oh, you need to tell him he's here for life. He needs more reassurance. No, he had all of that. He had all of that. So that would be the head word association. When you actually connect with him, it was Oliver's self-worth. No matter what you gave Oliver, and it brings tears to my eyes, <clears throat> just pause. He had to feel it inside and it wasn't, he died at 14. And um, it's, a, it's a good story. And at 12 was the day Oliver realized we love him unconditionally. And what, wow. what happened now, I started the story, he made the biggest mistake of his life. He made the biggest. And I, I referenced my dog Merlin and what happened is Oliver, when he was 12, attacked Merlin. And he sat on Merlin and his attack, created a wound in the mouth as a result of the wound merlin had to go into the dentistry for dentistry and he was he got anesthesia and um the vet did a little bit of malpractice as a result of that merlin 
got colic. Colic can mean death in a dog. I rushed him from one vet to another vet to an emergency room. <sighs> All comes back to Reiki, Miriam. And the vet said, your dog is dying. Oh my God. And he said, the elevations are high and um, he won't come out. And I remember to this day, I said, I'm not signing that you can euthanize my dog. You can't. Your job is to do surgery on him and he is to wake up. And, what, and I said, um, I just want to find out what's going on. And he looked at me and my vet friend was with me and she kindly said, she said, look, I will take care of Merlin when we get home because Merlin's coming home. So it wasn't that I was being remiss. It was more my dog's going to wake up because I made him that promise. He went into surgery and my friend said, send out a Reiki request. Talk about not wanting to. I went, I'm done with social media. It was displacement. Never going on again. I hate it. And, and this is it. I'm losing my soulmate. I'm losing everything. And she said, just put out a Reiki request. And I did. Typed it out. Shut off the phone. Uh, got into a heap, was crying, and my world was falling apart. The surgeon came out, and um, he said, I have no explanation to what's happened here. There is nothing wrong with your dog. He has a full recovery. We opened him up. There's nothing wrong. I cannot explain it. And Merle's came home. As a result of it, there were a few people, maybe a dozen, that said, what's going to happen to Oliver? And I'm thinking, what's going to happen to Oliver? What do you mean, you know? Including close family members, not in this house. And it was this thing of, well, he's dangerous. You can't trust him with your child. Or Merlin, what do you mean you can't trust him? He made a mistake. And we looked at Ollie and we said, it's not your mistake. It's mine. I didn't protect you from yourself. Mm -hmm. I failed you. Always brings tears. And I couldn't give you what you needed. And I made a promise and I said, I'm going to take care of you far better. I'm going to make sure you're not put in a situation where you're out of control and I'm going to manage it for you. And I'm going to be here for you more. As did Vin. And Vin, my husband, has the biggest heart ever. And Vin turned around, of course, to went, Ollie's Ollie. We love him to bits. Nothing changed. We loved him more. Merlin made a full recovery. We loved him more. And we said, it's ours. That was the day Oliver never did an attack again and he suddenly found out who he was. He suddenly saw, it's true, we love you unconditionally. We didn't create a condition. There's nothing you could do, Ollie. You're going to be loved anyway. You're going to be seen anyway. And he changed. So these are the scenarios to, to realize of, it could be as superficial as a dog acted like a dog got territorial um her dynamics or pack dynamics when somebody's getting older it's a normal pack dynamic yeah it is it's a piece though that's a piece plus behavior plus reflections plus responsibilities and roles and souls contracts so not everybody wants to layer it that deep miriam and when they make a call they can be as simple as it can be to of why did he do it well He's getting older and he challenged a position. It can be that simple. But if the client really wants to know or the person wants to take responsibility, then we look at management of how do we go about going forward? There's management. And then we can look at the self-esteem. And so we can also layer it here, not only layering to learn your language, but layering it to say, how deep are we going to go? on this one session or do we need multiple sessions to get deeper and deeper into this because there's so much more to life and the animals and the animal communication teaches us there's so much more to life it's not just about being born and getting married and having a career and dying there's so much more to it and they show us through their actions you know what i love that story um the emotion. <laughs> but it's beautiful and i think it's sort of it reminded me that, um, you know, growing up, I didn't, I didn't really know that I was lovable. You know, for me to believe people uh, that they were loving me, it was quite hard. I, I was a little bit suspicious. I came from a family that was a little bit emotionally distant. And so for me, it was more 
it was easier to be a little bit like if I keep my 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 uh, you know my distance, then I'm okay. Um, you know, getting married, meeting my husband, it took a while, and it still takes sometimes. You know, I need to remind myself this is okay. You know, I'm being loved, and so it's it's this this continuation of somebody loving you that makes you see see that and you know in your story that was so beautiful because um you needed to show him even more that he's loved not punish him because that would have been this this what he had in his mind anyway that you know i don't have the self-worth you know i'm going to be punished because i'm not good enough or something like that so um the same with like children from from uh, you know coming from foster homes or you know having been passed around because they don't the parents can't take care care of them um you know i feel the same it would be so easy to kind of go we love you unconditionally and take that that trauma away from them so it, it kind of it reminded me that you know, we humans and animals, we're not so different. You know, we're very similar. Yeah, and he was a foster kid. He'd been handed around five times before he came to us. And and that's that's the life lessons. And it's funny, I don't always remember all the titles of my webinars, but it will help you understand that the first one I called The Real Deal. So all the webinars came together to become the home study pack, but it was called The Real Deal because for me, it's so important that it's honest, it's real, and it's not we believe it's real no it no it is real there's all these validations my next webinar was called just a belief away because there'd be so many people that would say oh i can't quite believe that or that's not in my belief what is a belief anyway you know let's just shift beliefs a moment or give it an opportunity to shift and another journey a journey of self-discovery was one of them and it became exactly that like you're saying we begin to learn from them to go okay that relates to me or that's how i have felt and how did i overcome that or did i not did i just bottle that up um and the fact we relate to them so greatly and we also called one a limit limitless language because this language is as big as you want it to be there's no limits so all that you say is exactly how we've framed it over the years because it became a, a journey of self-discovery you know with only limits that you put on yourself. It's beautiful. And we we could teach everybody everything through the animal communication. And I've enjoyed that over the years. You kind of said, is that the coaching part? Um, my dream when I left the UK, I only took a sabbatical from the police force, was to go back and do equine coaching. I learned horse whispering for a year, intending to support victims and first responders more. But I soon discovered that one, California versus England, two, horse whispering versus policing, and three, actually this is gonna take way longer than a year. You wanna be good at this and you wanna create something incredible. It took years. I've always coached. I've coached veterans, at-risk kids, kids that have cut themselves. I've coached people that are suicidal, lost children. My whole career as a horsewoman, I've coached 20 years worth. And I've coached the animals too. So my life path to help people that need support, be it emotional support of a loss, grieving, et cetera, or, or um, coming back from a war, or looking at physical support from individuals in wheelchairs coming to Reiki classes in Sweden, and, you know, or even a horse whispering class here in Colorado in wheelchairs, people having lost limbs, they're hearing partial sight i've coached them all now that helps you with the animal communication too and it helps you to go back to the animal and talk sometimes about the limb or the ptsd in the past so a lot of the animal communication although we we learn the language to receive and dialogue a part of it's about talking to them and coaching them so part of the coachings for the people but parts for the animals otherwise they can't change behavior you know 
So they need that person to listen, but more so or equally as important, they need that person to have guidance to help them through a situation. And you can't do that if you don't have any life experience. So for me, again, this, this animal communication journey, you can start as a kid, absolutely. And you could get all the light stuff and the fact you can hear them and dialogue with them, absolutely. But the more depth and the biggest problems, you'd need life experience. But then you wouldn't draw it either, Miriam. You know, I, I've had cases where a horse has been accused of murder. I've had a case where a horse has been sexually abused. Mm -hmm. I've had horses that are going to be put down for behavior. A child couldn't coach on that necessarily. Maybe they could deliver information which would be vital because the, the adult or the sponsorship or the organization would hear it and be blown mm -hmm. away that there's information coming. But at the same time, if that animal needs coaching on how to transition, maybe we need life experience for that. So hopefully that explains depth in multiple facets yeah. even. That's, uh, you know, it's wonderful. And um, I love listening to you and, uh, you know, your approach because I feel it's a little bit different from other animal communicators, uh, communicators because you're very structured in your approach. And I quite like that. You know, it, it wasn't the way I learned it. I, I went in through the feeling a lot more, through the body sensation, you know, the meditation, the connection, um, you know, having guides going, going into this sort of from that. Um, mm -hmm. it, it's, but I like this approach of, um, and it, it maybe this stimulates my sort of script writer brain a little bit. Where am I? You know, what is, what is happening and, and structuring everything. So, um, yeah, it's, it's, I think it's so interesting to, to hear what people do and how they, they do it and, and what they sort of, um, why they're doing it. And um, because it's, you can learn from all different sides and approaches, you know. And, and there's something for everybody. And, and for me, I can teach the shorter clinic where it's all about what you're receiving and that's great hit, absolutely. And then I love the mentorship to get the depth because that's who I am. If you're changing lives, saving lives, giving another chance, and you're also entering the industry that I do, you better be on your game and you better be the top of your game. And at the same time, I also appreciate and admire where they've got the um, download of information that's very poetic. And I've got a client and student that's exceedingly poetic and she writes something that you could frame and that's needed as well. And so everybody has something to offer. I feel that when you get to the point of being a professional, you, you better be on your game. And so a lot of this is about educating people of here's your dream. Let's answer it. Here's your calling. Let's answer your calling. Here's a passion you can have. And how dedicated and committed are you for truth, for truth and authenticity? Because I guess my whole career, it's always been about authenticity and truth, always. I was a police officer for the RSPCA. And so I was the one on duty that any animal case would come to for a number of years. And for me, that was about the justice. It was about the truth. It was about um, creating the harmony, bringing up the underdog and helping them out, giving a voice to those that didn't have a voice. So my first career has transpired into this career because I'm doing the same. It's for animals this time and for people. So I've added, it's so funny, I thought in my 20s, oh, I'll get less responsibility, but you know, and love the horse whispering piece, tons of responsibility with million dollar horses and, and famous actors and actresses actually where I was and people's lives and so on. And then I thought, oh, I'll do animal communication. Maybe you can just do something light and fun and, and stuff like that. Nope, not me. I, I call in, this horse is going to be utilized and unless you speak to him by this time. And you think, wow, my job is all about justice. My job is to show the world that even if I change their paradigm and they're going to yell at me and that's happened where they've yelled at me really angrily when I've been in their home in another country, 
and going, this is not possible. You couldn't have known that. You must have been in our home and looking around and you're looking at it going, you've been with me every second. I'm sleeping in a hotel. I've only been in these two rooms. How can you know what the upstairs looks like? You know, and I've had that in multiple places, even in Georgia, where a guy said, I checked every piece of information you said, it's not available on Google, was his response. I don't know how you did this. So for me, I feel like I can open up that paradigm. Not everybody's willing to go through it. Not everybody is comfortable. They can get frightened by it. So a lot of this is about opening that mind. It's not just the heart. It's about the mind of, you've been institutionalized, you've been shown a certain way that you believe. And I know after 20, 30, 40, 50 years, I'm coming along and saying, well, actually we can remote view. Well, actually we can talk to the dead and it's your birthright. Of course, that's gonna really upset people, I get that. Or if I'm saying, well, did you know your dog can have the heart attack for you? That's not a fun delivery to make, um, but at the same time, it changes it because people can compartmentalize and go, well, the dogs, the dog, the horses, the livestock, if I treat them like livestock, they don't have the same feelings or they don't have the same memory. And most people don't think animals have hopes or desires or dreams. They don't. I, I wrote a quote the other day and they had to question the quote because it's this piece of your dream. Let's hope that we're realizing theirs as we go down the road. How many horses, 99% of horses, are told what to do and their hopes and dreams are not being followed, 99%. 1% is natural horsemanship. Within that 1%, how many are using animal communication and energy healing? They're not, it's still systematic. So the methods that I'm offering is probably point something percent of the horse world. People aren't ready. You know, there's a, a tiny piece that's ready and yes, it's growing, but you're telling them, does your horse have a voice? Does your horse have a choice? What's the role of your animal? What's their soul's contract? And they look at you like you're crazy unless they're following along. And so it takes time to bring change. I completely agree with you. This is, it, it does, it does. And uh, we're on this path and sometimes you feel that it's so logical and how can people not see it and how can people go through that? Um, yeah, sometimes you just need to accept that people are on a different path yes. um, without losing your, your passion for, um, you know, opening people's eyes. Yeah. Yeah. So I was wondering, I was thinking, what about you prepared a little exercise? I did. And I think we've covered some of it <laughs> as okay. we were going, which is kind of neat because my exercise was to support individuals as to how do they know if they're connecting. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to give a little bit of an answer first, but how do they know they're connecting when it's spontaneous? That's one when it's spontaneous. And when it comes sort of out of um, out of the ordinary, unexpected. When it's unexpected and spontaneous, that can often be intuition and animal communication. That's one piece. The other piece would be when we're dropping from the head to the heart. So we're changing and usually people can feel the different energetic response to that. And they can try that at home. When you're in your head, you're gonna hear all of the voices or see the pictures and it's gonna be active. But a good way to drop into the heart is to put the hands on the heart. It's as though the hands are placing the focus on the heart. And it's a really nice way to drop into the heart. Doesn't matter if we're doing horsemanship or mm. if we're doing animal communication. It's a moment of realigning to say, okay, you're busy, you've got to get it done. And time's of the essence, and we don't have much time. And here's the system to go, you know what? You're seeing this animal only for this long. Can we drop into the heart a moment? And when we do that and we connect, be it with a white light to them or activating our energy healing, no matter which way you connect. We then have different ways to identify it, to say, what is the imagination? And you can identify, like I said, if you're looking at um, Lassie, the dog, and we talked about a collie maybe, and suddenly your imagination goes running off with you. And you notice that it's imagination and the clarity of it. Or we look at a preconceived idea. So for example, if something's happened with a certain 
horse that you say, you know what, preconceived um, ideas. I've heard that my friend said chestnut horses are all sensitive and crazy to work with. So now it's a preconceived idea. So you could be entering with it and you begin to notice and you look at it to go, when I looked at that picture, do I have a preconceived idea? Eliminate it. Or do we have a projection? And a projection would be a past experience. So for example, a projection could be, I've had a border collie and they get so intense and they follow that ball and that's it. And you realize actually that's a projection. I felt the difference between imagination, preconceived projection. And another piece to it would be the word association. I love this piece. So you begin to look at it to say, if I say sun, what do you think of? You could even think, is that S-O-N, sun, or is that S-U-N? But sun, you might think sunshine. You might think beach. Or if I said coffee, <laughs> do you guys place it? Is it Costa Rica? Is it Germany? Is it real coffee, instant coffee? Do your taste buds go? word association. So within this exercise, we begin to look at the difference of the realization to know that our brain is so comprehensive, we have all of these capabilities. And as soon as we identify these capabilities, we also then can identify when I'm in meditation, does my mind go to my to-do list at first? Because we have to eliminate that. Does my mind go into dreaming of what could be? Well, that's a dream, isn't it? And in the meditation too, we look at where do we default to? Because we could dream to manifest. So a lot of this is about awareness and the exercises from all these that I've mentioned, preconceived, projection, imagination, word association, memory, that's five, and then animal communication we come back down to, yeah, there's only a small chance when we first start to identify animal communication. Awareness is the key to have the awareness of what are we identifying. And here's the challenge. You can't really do it to afterwards because if you're doing it during, you're overthinking and you're not being. So if you go, oh, was, was that word association? You'll fall out of animal communication. So the challenge that I challenge people to would be do this anyway, do it anyway, and then look back. And when you look back of all you've written, is it all accurate? Did you know any of that already? Is it all new to you? Did you fall out into imagination or memory? Look back, but don't do it during. If you do it during, not only is it hard to stay in the heart because you go to the head because you're thinking and you're dropping into the heart, but also you're breaking that connection. So you're not just moving to the head, you're physically, physically, you're physically breaking the connection, which pulls you out. You don't want to do that. And then there's a third aspect of it, which would mean if you're pulling out, you're being kind of disrespectful to the mm. animal, even not knowing it, because you're overanalyzing, which is if you're connected, you're doubting the animal. You're doubting the animal by doubting yourself. So don't doubt yourself. And I don't want to overcomplicate it. I really want to say, come back to what Miriam said. Smile, me meditate, send that light, enjoy the process. Don't overthink anything I said. Write it down, love it, look back at it and look back. And you always reflect to go, could have done that differently. Or I stood in my way because I doubted that and didn't trust it or I influence that here, look back, and then next time you improve and you get better. And that's how you get better and you get the connection to become stronger because they trust you, because they have to trust your abilities as well. And you trust your abilities and it becomes light. You don't want it to be heavy. And another thing that people do is they get so consumed with, with them that they go, well, I can't do this or, I was wrong there. You didn't do anything 10 minutes ago. Mm -hmm. Celebrate the fact you did this. You know, don't look at all what you didn't do. Look at what you did do. You didn't even know it was possible a year ago. So celebrate the possibilities and then layer it. 
exactly as you're layering again, which would be start with just the simple enjoyment. Enjoy it and then start dialoguing. Don't try and um, run before you can walk would be the key on that exercise. So as people break it down, Miriam, hopefully they heard it and the exercise would be to identify which one was the real animal communication and ways to identify that as well as the exercise to say, here's another way to drop into your heart. Okay. So not really a meditation, different kind of exercise. Yeah. yeah. So is this, you want to go into that um, or is it like a sort of... Um people take, take um, the inspiration and uh, do it themselves. I want them to do it themselves right. at the right time because I find that if they were right. to write that down, then take it away, it's going to be easier than if I simply guide it or send them a picture and they try it. It would be harder because then there's the pressure of mm. the um, webinar, there's the pressure and the pressure to actually achieve it. But it's actually far easier and simpler to say, take this exercise with you and work with it in time to see how it supports you. Do you know what? I'm thinking this is a great challenge. Um, so we could challenge people to actually try this. And if, if they feel comfortable, they could, you know, let us know how it went or put it on, on social media and say, this is what happened when I was talking or communicating to my dog, my cat, my horse, or um, my bird. And um, yeah, I think it's, this, yeah, it's great. I'm going to try that tomorrow. <laughs> Perfect. I'm going to be more detailed so that you can try something in particular and it will help people because otherwise they get a bit confused too. So if everybody has a horse at home, this is a great exercise to do. And they either have the horse at home or at a barn, a delivery yard, boarding facility, a question center, whatever you guys call it, where you're tuning in from, you would set a time that you're going to visit. And you're going to set the time that that horse knows you're coming 3 p.m., making that piece up. And now this happens in many different ways. If your horse is at home and you needed to call them in for dinner, set the time, let's say six o'clock. And you envision them coming in and you're going to have their dinner waiting. See what happens. If you don't have that luxury and you're going to catch them because you're at the barn, set the same time, prepare them ahead of time, see how they respond. So either way, you're calling a horse in has to be positive. What you can't do, you can't just go 3 p.m. be at the gate. You know, you can do that, but that would be like a a lover right meet me at this time you don't want them to say that you want a bit of romancing you know it might be hey would you like to meet me here for coffee a little bit like that so you're saying hey would you like to meet me i'm gonna have treats or i'm gonna have food or we're gonna go riding in nature envision it you have to envision it and put emotion in an emotion behind it there's a practice for a horse if you have a dog and you haven't done this before you could do when you're getting home. I'm going to be coming home at this time. And you can show the way the greeting's gonna look. So if your dog jumps up, show them how it's gonna look. If your dog's fine, show them anyway. It's gonna be a happy encounter. So show them the time you're coming home. If that's not working for you, because you can't see every step of the way, you would do something like, I'm gonna go on the computer for one hour. Don't just do the one hour and the clock. Do the time. So I'm going to get home 8 p.m. I'm going to go on the computer 8 to 9. And at 9 o'clock, you and I are going to hang out, see what the dog does. Okay? But you're going to do a great hanging out. Hanging out means could be rubbing your belly. Mm -hmm. be sitting on the sofa watching TV. Show them at that time the joy, the positivity. Show them and do the clock. That's the second one. If you don't have a horse or a dog at home, let's look at the cat. So with the cat, it's interesting because they don't always come, right? So we'd have to do something else, but you could still do it. If you've got an outside cat, Germany, they can go out more than here. You could also call them in for a certain time for dinner. Practice that, show them their favorite food, delicious food, make it mouth watering, send that white light, 
if the cat's indoors, you could do a similar activity. So there we go. We have our activities that we can challenge them on. So it's not just the structure. They can fall into the heart. They can get the answers and they can begin to introduce, become introduced to animal communication and bring some joy, you know, joy and ease. And it starts at a very simple place that makes everybody happy. You know what? I'm so inspired. I'm going to try this. I'm going to, I mean, my cat comes in at a certain time anyway because we're having this little um arrangement where we have three cats and two cats are for my husband and one cat is for me and these are our stepchildren basically so um, we have to have the one cat coming in for food the other cats going out <laughs> so it's a little oh, bit yeah so um they That's they want to try so we yeah but it's and always, Miriam, it brings another aspect, and I keep on layering everything now, but it brings another, choose the one that's really your animal first, because that, that really applies for people at home. You, you've got a natural connection with your animal, strong connection, start there. And, and the actions will be validated in their actions, right? It's always a bit more complicated to talk to our own animals and get a ton of dialogue for another reason, for another time. But when we're practicing animal communication in action, and that's what I called it on YouTube, actually, animal communication in action, um, then we're practicing this piece to see the cause and effect in a way. And we're doing this heartfelt piece with the one we have the strongest bond with. Really important to start there. And then you could try it with your others too and go, you know what? Actually, it wasn't easiest with my strongest one. It was easiest with this one. And then you could look at why, you know, is it the personality? Is it you? And it can become really fun to, to look back on hindsight and the different voices that come out and the different styles, personalities. And we can really get into the individualism of the animal and animal communication. But um, yeah, listen, it was so nice. It, I'm so inspired um by your talk and uh, by our conversation and your exercise as i said i'm going to try this um it's i think we all a lot of us are doing something similar already that you're kind of projecting these you know i'm coming home but again make it more um detailed to make it more you know um touchable you know it's sort of <laughs> more it's, deliberate yeah and the positive emotions the key yeah. so i think the piece for people to realize the animals are talking here you know in their heads we're talking so we got everybody talking and the conduit between the two the transmitter is the language of love so it means drop into the heart but it also means you've got to have an emotion to it and it's always a positive high vibration emotion and so even if we're telling somebody off, we're looking at positive high, high vibration. And so when we're thinking of them coming home, the joy excitement will place people into their heart space. And thus we have the emotion, which is the component we need to gel this together. So that is go. so beautiful. Thank you so much, Anna. This was, well, this was lovely. Um, one last thing, how can people find you and your programs? Thank you. We, we are in the process of updating our website at some point, but it's reachouttohorses.com. And within that, once we get the new one up and running, it would be really, really neat because it would be with great clarity of horsemanship and animal communication and coaching. But they can get a hold of us that way, but also through YouTube, if you want to look at that. We have 12 DVDs and one's animal communication and one's an original Reiki for Horses DVD. So there's options. They don't have to commit to the home study or the in-person. We have YouTube. We have free webinars. I've always wanted to take care of everybody, honestly. So every year we've done at least four to six free webinars for people in depth, really in depth, as well as the animal communication piece. And the Gloria, not quite sure where your audience is, Miriam, and how far it goes, but I am fortunate to come to Germany and I've been there for 10 years straight. And I, I have to tell you this funny story. I have the most unique teaching style because all the Germans speak German with me because I understand it, not a problem. And it's really cute. Everybody speaks German and I'm happy because I can practice and I love the language. 
And yet to teach, you have to have specific wording that I probably don't have to teach that way. And I get a little bit nervous because I can't be fast enough teaching. So I speak English. Mm -hmm. So you have this incredibly funny clinic, me English. So they do need to speak a little English, but they can then speak German because they're probably also a bit rusty at it. And right now um, I'm looking to return to Germany. And if not, I'm in Europe. So I'm in Denmark, Germany, um, England. So people can hop over with greater ease. Like, like we do in the US, we jump from one state to another. You guys have the ability to jump from one country to another. So um, yeah, check out your, um, your tour dates because you're on, on the road quite a lot. So um, you're, you're touring with your, your programs. Um, again, thank you so much. I felt that was that was so inspiring and uh, I love your approach. I could have listened to you for another two hours, I think. On, on, you knew this would happen. You knew it would happen. Yeah. You would have stayed to your theme and probably moved everywhere. But I also, I appreciate you. And um, I really appreciated your perspectives today. I really did. And for you to bring it home to say how you felt and how you could relate to Oliver is huge. Um, and it brings tears again. It's silly. I'm talking about my, actually, you know what? Just stay there and I'll finish my sentence. Um, that piece that you related to you, really important because that's how you'd relate to him. So if you were talking to Ollie and he happened to bring up that topic, I, I could go off on a tangent here because the students, they wouldn't say, hey, I'm Miriam and I can relate to you because this has happened to me and I know you know this. Um, but if he ever brought it up, it's a way where we can say, you know what, I feel your pain, something similar has mm -hmm. happened to me and this is what helped me. And I think people also forget that we can do that. We can bring in what's helped us. And if we've got a ton of experience, not only are we interviewing or lecturing but we're truly having that compassion to go I, I feel for you too yeah. and what's happening so here it's funny I can do this now that is Merlin that one oh, it's weird to have me next to Merlin but there's Merlin and so for people that were listening where I said a little picture of he's black he's gray he's white um, it gives you an idea to say what would people perceive here and you know what you see, it's a great exercise. <laughs> Give them another exercise. What are you seeing? You know, you describe in detail. And if somebody said, oh, I see a bandana, that identifies him as well as the coloring. I bet first you describe what you see as human and animal and so on. And then you describe the essence. And then it would be that intuition to go intuitively, when was that taken and where? And what does he want to say? So that's all of, uh, that's Merlin. That's his hair look. And then um, this is Oliver that you guys are going to go a little closer. There's Ollie and there's Ollie and I, but there's Oliver. And he is also the one I referenced to. Um, and he's gorgeous. And they're both Australian shepherd crosses. And once again, you could intuit from that to what do you truly see? What do you hear? What do you feel? When was it taken? Where was it taken? And people can get the idea of what I was trying to explain. But those are the two boys my very um very wonderful and beautiful boys my soulmates and they're actually on the animal communication facebook page you'll see them at the top where i've honored them you know so really really neat to bring them in but yes i loved your approach and the the aspects that you were bringing out miriam as well really important okay thank you so much anna and uh, i hope to meet you in person somewhere in europe or maybe in the states one day you're um, giving me the chills. I have, look, can you see my chills? <laughs> oh, yeah, that look, that wow. means that we're going to meet in Denmark, right? <laughs> oh, look at the chills. Can you, can you see them or do I? Yeah, probably I just look. There, you can see chills. Yeah. I haven't had chills and suddenly got the chills. I will take those as confirmation chills that we're Good. meeting. Good, yes. Um, so thank you very much. Thank you. Thank and, you. Thank you. And, um, and Bye bye to, to uh, Colorado. <laughs> yes, bye bye to Colorado. <laughs> Take care. Bye now. <laughs>